this is a, a young and creative individual, and I will turn over to you, uh, Josh Watts, to talk about, let me read the title here, Traces of the Individual in the Distant Past, Projectile Points, Experimental Archaeology, and Ancient Craftsmen. Josh. <laughs> Tonight, um, I have a few threads that I want to try and bring together. Um, first of which is I want to talk a little bit about the individual in prehistory, uh, which is something that archaeologists in general don't, don't talk very much about. Um, I'm going to swing around to talking about some experimental archaeology, um, and particularly uh, flint napping, which I'll explain more about. And then finally, I uh, try to sort of bring it home with an actual application to an archaeological case, um, particularly focused on the uh, Tonto Basin, central Arizona, so a modern sort of area around Roosevelt Lake. First thread, then, is this individual in prehistory, which, as I said before, um, archaeologists just haven't, haven't spent a lot of time talking about. One of the phrases that uh, uh, help motivate me in this research is something that comes out of uh, anthropological research of the early 20th century and that was um, basically can be summarized as trying to do ethnography of the past trying to explain where that comes from you have to think a little bit about how I guess the history of anthropology and the history of archaeology as it's practiced in North America and specifically in the early 20th century um, a lot of you know, anthropologists were sort of first building this into a discipline that was a uh, sort of formal academic discipline. And um, a lot of the motivation behind that is that they were looking around North America, um, seeing tribes, uh, seeing people in tribes that were basically on the verge of disappearing. They felt like they were going away. As they sort of established their discipline, they did an awful lot of talking to people um, and observing these cultures and trying to document what was going on in these cultures um, in case those peoples disappeared. Um, a subset of those anthropologists, particularly hanging out here in the Southwest, spent some time looking at, at a number of the ruins around the southwest and began to realize that there was basically a lot in common with these prehistoric ruins and with what the, the modern peoples that they were um, studying. And so those folks that sort of their interest turned toward the past end up more or less founding kind of the modern discipline of or archaeology as it's uh, practiced here in North America. The anthropologists who studied living peoples um, their, in their work, basically, what they did was ethnography. And so they were doing the, the writing, or interviews, and observations to basically describe what was going on with the current people. Um, archaeologists, on the other hand, um, did not have that opportunity. They weren't able to talk to one another, or weren't able to talk to the people that they were studying. Instead, and this is something that Bill kind of alluded to, archaeology has often um, become sort of about generalizations that are fairly broad. Um, we talk about sort of entire cultures. Often we talk about big chunks of time. You know, um, hundreds of years end up getting summarized. And um, in that, basically, there's, not, there's no individuals in that research, um, even though sort of in all honesty, I mean, we, we know that when we look at a pot or maybe a pit house that was built, we know that an individual um, probably made that pot, maybe more than one individual. We know there were people involved, but they kind of disappear sort of in the context of the other, other questions that archaeologists tend to ask. Another sort of somewhat interesting contrast is uh, archaeology and the, the discipline of history. And sort of often in history, you've got uh, a much more explicit focus on the individual. Um, you know, history is often about sort of, you know, great individuals. Um, whether you're talking about generals or whether you're talking about kings or queens, um, but part of what archaeology contributes to is sort of this understanding of the past that isn't um, focused on these extraordinary people. I mean, we try to study a lot of what, you know, what ordinary people do, understand ordinary ways of living. Now, um, there are uh, some 
I know, interesting and sometimes entertaining sort of places where these disciplines cross. Um, I'm thinking specifically of this, this winter. Um, you may have read about uh, King Richard III being excavated out of a parking lot in central England. Um, and so, uh, and there, there are other cases if you think of, um, you know, digging up pharaohs in Egypt or something like that where sort of, you know, archaeology gets very focused on an individual. But in general, um, particularly in North America, it's not something we do very much of. But sort of where case I wanted to make uh, right now is that I think there is something important about um, patterns and behaviors of the past. Uh, and basically that everyday individuals and particularly unique individuals um, that archaeology is pretty well suited to study. Um, but so far we've not done a, a terrific job of pursuing those kinds of questions. Um, and so I think that uh, if we can figure out what to measure and how to analyze it, maybe we can get a little bit closer to this idea of doing ethnography of the past. In Southwest archaeology, there are I know, a, a couple of people who have sort of had, had this idea. Um, certainly I am not the, the first one who thought there was a problem here. Um, in the 1990s, there was a uh, student at the University of Arizona named Scott Van Curen um, who did some pretty interesting work looking. Uh, he was measuring things like brush strokes on painted pottery and was basically able to make a case that measuring, measuring how these, the, these pots were laid out um, and the way that the, the designs were executed that he could identify the individual crafts person, craftsman, craftswoman who, who made that pottery. So he was working in the grasshopper area, um, also working in the grasshopper area about 10 years before that, um, a guy named John Whitaker, who's also a U of A graduate student, who um, got interested in looking at uh, chipstone and particularly projectile points. And so he was looking at small arrow points. Um, and he felt like that if you could figure out what to measure on them, you could probably figure out who, who made them. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is basically sort of a spin-off or derived from some of the work that he did in the 1980s. Uh, I've got to say that in the decades since he did his work, the methods that we're able to employ, particularly with computers and image analysis, are a great deal more sophisticated than he was able to do. <clears throat> All right, so as I mentioned, sort of this problem of the individual in prehistory has resurfaced um, you know, hand, you know, once a decade, give or take, over the last last 20, 30 years. Um, but generally, it can be boiled down to sort of this problem of A, sort of how do we identify the work of individuals. Um, there's this you know, methodological problem of looking at something and figuring it out. And then B, sort of what would we do with that information if we could? Um, the archaeologists, again, like I said, they're interested in these big picture questions. We're not used to thinking about what what we may be able to learn from looking at this individual scale. With that, I'd like to shift gears and talk a little bit about experimental archaeology. Um, I imagine most of you that are here know what I'm talking about, but um, if you don't, I'll provide a little example. Um, so experimental archaeology is generally the, the process by which Sort of modern folks, usually archaeologists, try to recreate some behavior in the past um, and hopefully gain some understanding about how it's done. So experimental archaeologists might go out and try to chop down a tree with a stone axe, um, or an experimental archaeologist might um, try to butcher you know, a bison using stone tools or something like that. Even, I don't know if any of you watch Discovery Channel and Mythbusters, but Mythbusters do all kinds of um, recreating, you know, prehistoric weapons and things like that. And so uh, these all fall under the heading of, of what I'd call experimental archaeology. The sort of specific brand of experimental archaeology that I got into is called flint napping. Flint napping is basically the, the craft, um, the art, whatever you want to think about it, of basically taking a piece of stone and sort of using percussive methods, um, breaking that stone down into usable tools, usually to create a sharp edge so that you can cut something. Um, the history of the term flint napping actually 
has a bit, it's a bit curious. We call it flint napping or napping, basically dating back to the, I don't know, I'll say 18th century with gun flint makers. Um, and so these guys who would, uh, were still at that time shaping the, the flints that would go into flintlock guns. Um, it's basically sort of the, the last gasp of sort of Stone Age technology um, that humans had been doing for probably, I don't know, well over 100,000 years, probably, probably 200, 400,000 years. But um, anyway, uh, the, the craft of flint napping largely was forgotten, um, certainly among Europeans, um, and then was sort of recreated by archaeologists and other interested people in the, you know, 1950s, 1960s, sort of recent decades, we've sort of had to rediscover how to do this work. Now, I started doing it about uh, 15 years ago. Um, I don't know, really right about the time I started doing archaeology, um, I started sitting around breaking rocks and sort of trying to get a sense of how this would work. Um, and let me... I'm not set up to do a full demo here today. Um, I thought about it and decided Makayos might not be the, uh, be the place to do this, but generally the way it works, um, I'm not, gonna, not actually going to break any rocks today, but um, is that uh, usually you start out with a large piece. Um, archaeologists usually call this the core. And then um, you take a hammer which is usually, at least at this stage of the game, um, uh, another kind of stone. You'd hold it in your hand or you'd rest it on your leg and you'd basically you know, knock a piece off of this. And you can see some of the scars here from where I'd knocked flakes off of this piece before. And so what you'd end up with then, sort of phase, phase two, your next stage, You'd have a piece that uh, would be a pretty good sized flake like this. Um, and you would take a different style of hammer. Um, usually, a, I call this a soft hammer that'd be made of antler. Um, sometimes you could use a hardwood. I've actually found that chew toys for dogs work beautifully um, for this. They're sort of hard plastic and have about the right heft and the right hardness. but. Um, and, um, and then you would basically proceed to knock sort of small little chips off of, off of this piece to thin it down and sort of rough out the shape of what the, what the point would look like. <clears throat> so this is, after, after doing that, you'd end up with something that looks about like this, sort of a preform or a blank, um, which you would continue thinning and continue shaping mostly with a, maybe a smaller hammer, um, lighter hammer. Um, but eventually, you're going to switch gears to uh, what's called a pressure flaker, which uh, prehistorically would usually be the tip of antler. Um, modern flint nappers tend to default to a handle that has a piece of heavy gauge copper wire set into it. Um, which again has sort of the right hardness um, and just easier to control. Um, so yeah, when I'm doing this, I usually use the copper unless I'm doing a demonstration and trying to, to show yeah, how, how it's really done. Um, now people have different techniques of how they go about finishing these things, but um, for the most part, what you'll see is somebody perhaps sort of sandwiching the, uh, the piece sort of between their fingers and the palm of their hand, maybe with a piece of leather, um, and then basically sort of pressing on the edge of the piece that they're working off to pop off smaller and smaller flakes um, until they get the shape that they're going for. So eventually you'd end up with something that might be an inch or an inch and a half long that would be about the right size to haft onto an arrow. An important detail about all this is that uh, at every stage of the process, uh, flint nappers tend to have different ways of doing things. Everybody's got their own style. And so um, I showed you the, the finishing by putting in the palm of my hand with the leather. Um, many people will sit down and drape a, a large sheet of leather across their leg and hold it on their leg to to press that off so you don't end up sort of having to, to muscle into your palm of your hand quite as much. So lots of different solutions and there's sort of no right way. 
um, so long as you end up with something that more or less looks and, and functions like an arrow point. Because I work as an archaeologist here in the Southwest, I ended up getting more and more interested in um, small arrow points that are a lot like what we find on the archaeological sites around here. Um, so sort of, you know, if you look in this bag of points that I've made, they almost all more or less mimic the styles that you see on sites around here. And so um, just my interest and sort of my focus as I got better and better at this was to, to kick out as many of these, these kinds of points as I could make. Now, um, one of the things when I'd sit around um, doing this, um, this kind of work, um, usually we try to make it something of a social event. If you can imagine a group of archaeologists and students sitting around with a six-pack of beer and some Band-Aids um, sort of trying to do this work. Um, is that uh, particularly in that final stage, a lot of people have some really different techniques. And so, um, you know, for example, at a pretty fine level, some people, they start at the tip and then they work their way down to the base. Or they might go the other direction, work at the base and work their way up. Um, some people have no pattern whatsoever. Um, they just sort of look for a sweet spot and, and push. Let me see if I can, I'm going to try and draw sort of a magnified look of what one of these things looks like up close. Um, and so what you end up with is you know, something sort of roughly triangular. Um, often has a couple of notches near the base to help haft it. Um, and then as people have popped off little flakes, you get these sort of scar patterns that start showing up. Um, as you go down the point. It may be down this side, they have sort of maybe some really severe sort of angles back that way. And sort of that pattern in some fashion or other continues all the way down. And so if you've ever picked up an arrowhead, you've probably seen something like that. One person you know, may have this pattern, but say somebody who used a different technique or um, just just had their own quirky way of doing this, you know, maybe all the the scars going down the right side would instead be almost nearly horizontal. And so, um, in theory, and this in a lot of ways sort of goes back to the the guy John Whitaker that I mentioned before. If you can figure out how to measure these things and sort of map these things. Um, you ought to be able to take a, a set of points and say, you know, Truman made this set and Josh made this set and they're sort of this different, um, you, you should be able to break them out more or less reliably. Um, now, um, concept in general isn't all that different from handwriting analysis, if you've ever sort of, that's essentially what I'm describing here is a signature. Um, and so you get, um, this idea of you've got largely unconscious, repetitive gestures resulting in patterns that are more or less unique to the individual. Um, gets a little bit complicated with this because there's a lot of factors that aren't easily controlled. Um, rock doesn't always break exactly as you want it to. Um, you know, you have flaws in the rock and of course there's yeah, people while generally very consistent, we all sort of have that day sort of where you've done something and you go, my God, what did I just do? Like, you know, that just, that don't fit sort of your usual routines and your patterns. And so um, one of the projects I've been working on is with an ASU undergrad to try and collect basically as many experimental points as possible from different flint nappers, primarily here in the Southwest, but really from around the country. Um, and get as many of their points as possible, um, measure the bejesus out of them, and try and see if we can figure out what the, uh, um, yeah, how consistent they are and whether it's really a reasonable thing to, to expect that we'd be able to break them out into, into, you know, basically their signature points by taking these measurements. Um, now, um, what I end up doing 
is a lot of measuring of these angles that these scars go at and also the lengths that these scars sort of protrude. And so if you are feeling sufficiently interested, um, there's a copy of an article that I recently wrote on this topic that has some pretty good diagrams of sort of breaks down the measurements that, uh, that I took. Basically, at this point, we're about halfway through the analysis, and we've got, I'm going to say, somewhere in the, the ballpark of 90, 90 points in, 90 points measured from uh, about eight archaeologists, or eight, some archaeologists, some avocationalists, but all flint nappers. Um, and the gist of it is, is that for experienced and good flint nappers, this works really um, pretty well. Um, you can, if somebody is settled into consistent patterns and how they make these things, so if they've, they've made a couple hundred of these things in their life, generally I can take their work and and break it into patterns. Um, I've also got a number of submissions from, um, say, like college students who've made, you know, only a handful of these things and they're not very good at it. And um, and those ones are just a smear. I can't, you know, there's almost nothing that I can do with those. Um, and so, um, I think this sort of back to the the handwriting analogy. Um, it's important important to be good enough at this um, to have any any hope of sort of seeing consistent patterns you know if you're trying to sort the handwriting of first or second graders um, you would uh, have a very tough time of it um, similarly with nappers who've never done much of this before um, and on the flip side um, this, will, this has only come up with one person so far, but if you're too good at this, um, when you're making these things, you're paying attention to these patterns. You're kind of like the calligrapher or something like that. Like you're an artist and you may want to make sure every last one of these things is parallel and it goes all the way across a point. And so somebody who's really got those kind of flint napping chops could throw a wrench in this program and so I had to decline the most amazing flint napper I've ever seen um, from including his points in this project because uh, he would have he would have messed things up um, another sort of useful use of that handwriting analogy is that uh, in order to um, sort of have any hope of taking sort of this kind of study and using these kind of measurements in the past is you need to be thinking in terms of what kind of context would it be reasonable to chase sort of this kind of thing. And what I mean by that is if you were to do a handwriting analysis and you had, I don't know, say a thousand people in your sample, um, you know, you'd never be able to figure out sort of who was who. There's just... Uh, sort of too much going on and sort of an inappropriate, um, inappropriate sample. Um, similarly with these um, flint napping things, we sort of run into a situation where, frankly, there's only so many ways you can make sort of a little point that's about an inch and a half long. And, um, and so at some point, if you had, you know, hundreds of years represented and you had, you know, hundreds or thousands of nappers represented, you'd basically just have uh, you, you'd be able to make groups, but whether those groups would have anything to do with the individuals you were interested in would probably not not be happening. So, um, sort of this experimental work has left me sort of cautiously optimistic that um, that this could be applied to a prehistoric case, and that's because most of the prehistoric flint nappers that we see here in Arizona are pretty good. Um, they're good, but they're not too good. Um, we don't see, you know, we see lots of perfectly functional, nice arrow points, but we don't see too many just outstanding works of art type thing. These, these folks, um, they sort of meet the criteria of good, but not too good. Um, <clears throat> and so basically to go ahead and try and complement this experimental work that I've done, um, I ended up trying to find an archaeological case that we could apply it to and sort of see, see what, you know, see what sorts of questions, what sorts of research we might try to do. 
Um, and so what I ended up focusing on is the uh, Tonto Basin, um, which is in uh, sort of central Arizona. It's up near Roosevelt Lake. I expect many of you have been there or know it. Um, reason why it was a good, good case for me is that uh, about 20 years ago, there was a really remarkable amount of research that was completed up there. Um, most of this happened in advance of the raising of the Roosevelt Dam. I think they brought up the dam 20 or 25 feet, something like that. And um, they expected that as the, as the water level rose, a number of sites would be inundated and many more sites would be impacted by sort of new recreational areas around the lake. And so um, a ton of archaeology was done. There was a uh, few companies involved. Um, and there was just uh, dozens and uh, dozens of small residential sites were excavated. And you have a handful of larger room blocks and compounds. So I ended up focusing on a subset of those sites that were in the eastern Tonto Basin along the Salt River. Um, they were occupied over basically a fairly narrow, and by narrow I mean a f about a 50 year window um, from AD 1275 to 1325. Um, and, um, this set of sites, I'll say about 25 of them were scattered along the banks of the Salt River, um, spread out about four miles. And so um, the researchers that worked there sort of had a number of questions that they wanted to address. Um, if you're interested, we have a couple of the reports that came out of that research on the table over there um, in the back. And um, basically, they were trying to figure out that you've got all these small residential sites, um, sometimes organized into clusters, um, and those clusters were linked by things like canal systems, and they were separated by things like the Salt River and site, side drainages, and um, they were trying to figure out sort of at what spatial scale was the community organized, sort of what were regular interactions, sort of what was, what was you know, how big was the village. Um, and so, maybe I'll try <coughs> to draw a quick and dirty map of what that area looked like. And so, imagine this is the Salt River. Uh, down here you've got uh, the dam. And uh, Salt River, as it heads up east out of the Roosevelt Lake and out of the basin, um, there's a bunch of little sites here and a bunch of sites here and then a handful kind of scattered around at different places sort of in between and so say the span of this is a you know, three maybe four miles something like that so they were trying to figure out sort of is this cluster kind of the relevant scale or was it something bigger there are a handful of sites and most notably a pretty good sized one that was right up here that um, had been argued to be um, locations where immigrant uh, populations had moved into the area. And so the room block style was very different and there's a number of other features about that site that made it look like per perhaps um, some folks from the Four Corners area of Northern Arizona had drifted down and, uh, and set, up a, set up their own little little residence there. Now, um, and they were interested in trying to figure out sort of, all right, so you have these new people, were they, you know, how were they incorporated into the existing community? <coughs> Back to sort of my contribution to this, um, is I thought it would be interesting to explore the idea that sort of by identifying the work of individuals and then mapping sort of their distribution of points in this community, maybe we could uh, begin to see what that scale of regular interaction among individuals was and sort of have, have some new data to contribute to this, uh, this sort of old problem in archaeology. So this is a project that was basically required no, do, no new data. Um, it's basically working out of the Archaeological Research Institute, which is um, the repository over at ASU, which is where all, this, all the materials that were excavated here ended up um, at the end of the, end of the project. This idea you know, of hopefully seeing individuals moving around this area, again, sort of gets me back to what I was saying earlier, which is that idea of the ethnography of the past. You know, we might actually see individuals and stuff moving around. Um, so I ended up measuring 
uh, an awful lot of arrowheads um, out of this, uh, which by that I mean about 150, um, which is maybe not a huge sample, um, unless you're an archeologist, and for an archeologist that's a big sample. Um, particularly if you're spending, I don't know, about half an hour each point to take the measurements. And so it was a fair commitment of time. Um, used essentially the same methods I was describing before with the experimental points, um, measuring angles and lengths of scars, that kind of thing. Um, and um, sort of created, using those measurements, created clusters of similar points. And then I took those similar points, which should be, you know, a probably made by an individual, and then I went back to the map and tried to see sort of where those points showed up. And so, for example, if in one cluster, which is one napper, uh, maybe there were five points in that cluster, and maybe I'd find three of them down here, maybe one of them over here, and one of them down here. Um, and so, the interesting thing for me ends up being this sort of connection that's showing that this, this person's stuff is moving around among these sites. Now, it's a little bit complicated when you're thinking about arrow points, like how, you know, how does an arrow point end up you know, at one place or another? Does it get shot at somebody? Does it get traded among friends? There's lots of different ways. Um, and frankly, for this research, I sort of sidestepped that problem a little bit. Um, and I, I do think that if you've got points at different places, it, it indicates some kind of relationship. But I don't think, um, I don't think I or anybody else is in a place to really try to, try to break down sort of how you get, how you get from one place to another. Um, if uh, on sort of the off chance that you're interested in the statistics that sort of get me to, uh, this phase of the project or process, it's all in that uh, that printed out article at the front table. So, um, not going to talk about that right now. Um, <clears throat> so, results-wise, though, uh, there are a couple of really cool observations that came out of doing this. And the first one is that um, you know basically individuals points are all over the place on this, on this map. And so, and really one of the, the strongest connections was between sites in this area and sites in this area. Um, important particularly because there's this connection that goes across the Salt River there. And so you got people who uh, are maintaining sort of this sense of community that is getting past natural barriers without too much trouble. Um, Sort of side note that's of interest is that these immigrant enclaves, these Im immigrant um, sites, tended to be included in the network of, of the rest of the community, but in a, in a much less, you know, much weaker way. Um, and so you would, uh, you would see this site maybe linked to this site, but just by a thread, um, there's really not. And so you end up with this situation where it looks like these immigrants are being incorporated into the community, but not, not entirely, not in the same way that, that the settled populations were. And so um, not unlike sort of, you think modern cities and sort of the immigrant enclaves that we have in modern cities with Chinatowns and things like that. So. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to try and wrap this up since we've got, got some hollering down the hall. Um, main thing is uh, there are sort of two, two significant hurdles to doing this kind of research. And one of them, as I mentioned before, is the, the met methodological problem. Um, sort of how do, you, how do you measure these things in order to get at this sort of individual scale um, information that might be of interest? And then, you know, finally, sort of what do we do with it once we figure out that problem. Um, it's much more a theoretical problem. So what I've tried to describe tonight is a way forward on both of those issues, um, at least related to projectile points and um, a particular case where sort of scale of community was of interest. Um, do you think that um, you know, individual scale data 
it's underused now, but there's definitely some potential in archaeology to use this kind of data to answer and go after questions that are uh, of interest to real-world archaeologists, not just those that are working in you know very highly controlled contexts and that kind of thing. So, um, at this point, I think I'm ready to take questions. He's basically asking if I did the stats to sort of assess how well this actually works, um, and. Um, it's in process. <laughs> I'm work, working on getting a big enough sample so that I feel like I can, you know, so if I can get 150 experimental points, I could then start to run those statistics to figure out how well the groupings hold up. How and will so, that process will, will it be something that other researchers can apply? I hope so. Yeah, the, the idea on this, um, and particularly this article that I've published. Um, the editor w was all over me to try and get me to write it so that it would essentially be instructions for somebody who wanted to do this work in the future. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think, and it takes some training um, in order to figure out how to take the measurements um, and run the stats, but I'm training an ASU undergrad right now, which is, um, says the bar is reasonably low. Um, <laughs> <I don't>, um, <laughs> so, so the question is kind of about immigrants um, and particularly, yeah, the Salado um, people in central Arizona. Um, depends on who you ask, sort of what, what they think about that right now. Um, this idea of um, immigrants and immigration as being sort of a hot topic in archaeology has this sort of cycle and right now it's kind of in an up cycle and we like uh, particularly folks here at the archaeology southwest um, are all over this topic of of immigration now um, sort of whether the salado as sort of a you know, i don't even know what to call them exactly they um whether they were immigrants or whether they were maybe a small group of Im immigrants that had a lot of influence on local people, um, a lot of that is sort of under discussion. Um, and there are better people than me out there to, to answer that question. So, but I think I mean, immigration is eh, sort of the last 20 years or so, we've really got some cool toolkits for studying immigration. And so it's, there's some, been some very good work on that topic. So, so asking a little bit about function um, of, of different, yeah. Um, so this is, it's not something I've spent a lot of time on, but definitely people have considered um, the idea that, um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that different <coughs> styles of projectile points are often different functions. Um, and so if you have a tiny little point yeah, maybe you're hunting birds or rabbits, or maybe you don't even need a point on your arrow to hunt. Um, yeah, if you're going warfare, you might have an entirely different point on your arrow. You might, you know, you might need something bigger. Um, there's sort of, and so yeah, they're uh, historically, um, ethnographically, it's been pretty well documented that there are different styles for different functions. Um, I think this is something that archaeologists haven't always done a very good job of because often they'll say a different style must be a different culture or a different, you know, different time period or different group of people. And there may be that um, an individual may be making different styles throughout the course of their life or different functions or just because they feel like changing it up a little bit. And I think those are things that we could study sort of taking these kinds of measurements. Yeah, but she's asking about whether I could determine handedness, left hand, right hand. And um, I haven't gone after that yet, but I think that's, that's going to be a cool side project for an undergrad student or something like that. It, um, it, I had a, a friend of mine in school who got really interested in handedness, um, but he was looking at very crude flint napping, like just the very basic sort of banging rocks together level, not the, um, not the finer work. And he was able to look at the distribution of stuff flying off of the rocks as you banged them and was able to make a case that you could look at the 
the spread of stuff, and he thought he could see handedness. Now, I'm not even, I'm going to follow up with my experimental nappers to see if any of them even are left-handed. Right, right now, I don't have any, anybody that I know is left-handed, and I don't have any women. So if you know any women who would have the experience to make these kind of things, please put them in touch, because uh, I think that would be yeah, another thing that might be interesting to throw in the mix to see if, yeah. Thank you.